One of the hardest lessons for women to learn is that you have to eat for strength training to work. The first inclination is to eat less and exercise more. Of course, it's been the message on social and unfortunately, even from the fitness industry for years. This episode and my guest will dispel those age-old myths. We're going to look at the needs of women over 40 discuss what lifting heavy means, and we'll share what she recommends for lifting frequency for women over 40 and explore optimal training as well as how you know you're lifting the right weight for you. A frequent question that I've been asked is, who should I have my daughter follow? Now, You are all here from a wide variety of ages, but I love Steph, and I would suggest that she is one of those people that may be a great voice to resonate with younger women in your life if for some reason I do not. (laughs) Depending on the age and stage of your daughter and or, of course, you, I may have a number of responses, and this guest is definitely someone we love here at Flipping 50. I'm Deborah Atkinson. You're listening to the Flipping 50 podcast, where I address your top struggles and concerns, but most of all, we really hope to inspire you. I share what to eat, how to move, and how to change your mindset often about what to eat and how to move so that you can have the energy and the vitality that you want, need, and deserve in this second and better half. Steph Gadro, strength, nutrition strategist, and lifting coach who helps women fuel themselves smarter is in the house. Get stronger. Gosh, we love those words here, don't we? Increase their energy and perform better in the gym. She's the author of The Core Four, Embrace Your Body, Own Your Power, and the host of the Listen to Your Body podcast. Steph, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Well, really, I mean, you teased me and uh, I had to like wait to get you here. So I'm really glad I got you. <laughs> I'm not not going to let you move. And before we dive into the real good, talking literally listeners about nutrition and how you feel yourself for the best workout, it's always nice to unpack, I think, the why and the why is this what you're doing? Mm-hmm. So really how did you determine that this was going to be the thing that you did when you grew up, if you could have done anything in the world? You know, I I think some people have a master plan for that kind of thing. And I really didn't. I sort of ended up here by, I would say, a combination of luck following my intuition and just sort of leaning into the things I was really interested in. Um, professionally, I started my career as a high school chemistry and biology teacher. So I'm a big nerd and I was a big <laughs> nerd in school. <laughs> um, and I had a choice, you know, studying biology, human physiology. There were a lot of my peers that were going to med school. A lot of people were taking a research track. And I just, neither of those felt right to me. So I actually ended up in the world of education. And I taught for 12 years, high school kids. So that was God my, bless you. Yeah. <laughs> that was my sort of foray into like the early part of my career. And there were a lot of things that were happening concurrently. And if I could be a little bit concise, I'll just say this much. I've been an athlete my whole life. Um, I'm somebody who has who sports and like athletics and just being active is really important to me. And Around 2010, 2011, I really started exploring lifting. I came from the world of endurance sports, triathlon, endurance, mountain biking, and Mm -hmm. a little bit of running. And I really was burned out and made my way into a lifting gym and the rest, as they say, is history. So that kind of kicked off this really interesting time in my life where I was exploring what my body could do and really focusing on that rather than just being as small as possible, which is really what my priority was when I was an endurance athlete. And spoiler, it didn't work very well. Um, You know, I'm sort of just have a natural body type. That is what it is. And, but I ended up pretty burned out, pretty underfueled. I had actually lost a lot of muscle mass and was really feeling kind of lost. So I ended up 
in a gym, started lifting, just really changed so much in my life. And that actually gave me the confidence to, instead of focusing just on what I looked like, I really started to feel this expansiveness that lifting brought to my life. I had had a blog on the side, which became my recipe and food website. And I left the classroom in 2013, a couple of years later to pursue working for myself. I wrote a cookbook and that morphed into me sharing more about what I was really passionate about, lifting, strength, helping women in the gym. I was coaching Olympic weightlifting as well. And that's sort of how I ended up here today. I've really just love helping other women step up to the bar or lift weights and and really make sure though that when they're doing it, they're not sort of ending up in the situation I was, which I didn't really know how to how to eat, how to fuel myself properly. And so my mission is a little bit sort of along those lines, you know, let's let's help women feel strong and let's let's get there in a way that's actually really supportive of our body, especially now that a lot of uh myself, I'm 43 and a lot of my peers are in their, you know, 40 somethings and it it just changes. And I know that you're a really big advocate for explaining that to your audience and providing them with really great education. So, you know, we can I believe we can be strong as long as we want to, but we just have to do things a little bit differently and be smart. Love it. Love it. And I had no idea that you were a teacher mm-hmm. and yeah, and, and a total nerd. I mean, really, who majors in that? All right. <laughs> but I love and I want to make sure that everybody here, so we'll have the links to Steph's accounts on Instagram specifically. And maybe that's the only place you are. That's really where I've discovered you. But what resonates so very strongly, see what I did there, um, <laughs> is your message to women about who they are and how the exercise helps amplify who they are instead of changing or shrinking, you know, who they are. And that is just, I think, a priceless, it stands out. And, and although great go you, right? Because you have very little competition, (laughs) but I can't wait until that message is coming from everybody. Mm -hmm instead of just for a few of us that I feel like are trying to help women just step into their own power and purpose, not to change themselves. Uh Uh-huh. A hundred percent. (laughs) I, I look out into the world and, you know, it's easy to be, surround yourself with the kind of messages and people who are really supportive and, you know, peers who are doing similar things. And you just, you have the sense of like, we're doing, we're doing it, we're doing it. And then you also, Get sent. I get sent a lot of messages and and ads and things like that where people just are so dismayed by what they're seeing. Some of the messaging, a lot of the messaging that's marketed at women forty and and older, is just makes my skin crawl and it really frustrates me. And so I guess I'm just doing what I can to put out a different option. You know, hey. There's also this other stuff. And I really do believe that lifting weights is a catalyst to a more expansive life, mm-hmm. to seeing you know, what else you can do and not just to do things for the sake of doing things and we have to like be busy and prove ourselves with what we can do, but rather to step into curiosity about who you are or things you've wanted to do or other ways that you advocate for yourself. A good friend of mine who also was a student in my program talked about, hey, you know what, actually, now that I'm feeling stronger and I'm I'm doing my lifting and I'm I'm eating better, I also notice that I'm advocating for myself more and what I need in my life. And I really do believe that lifting weights has that power to to expand you know, your your life to to open up possibilities that you didn't quite know were there. And I think that's what's really powerful about it. Yeah, I I think in some ways, and of course, I talk so much about like hormone balance and the hormone balance support that you get. But I recently just read this statement as like, geez, I wish I would have thought of that myself a long time ago. But 
your muscle acts like an endocrine organ. Mm -hmm. So I think, of course, it's going to help, you know, especially if it's more like serotonin than it is like cortisol. Mm -hmm. And it helps you promote more of your own estrogen and right balance of progesterone and testosterone in doing that. I mean, we need a little bit of that alpha badass. And then we also, you know, need the other. So I, I so love that. Okay. Let's for listeners, let's get into a little bit of the nitty gritty. So the the stuff that you're really so very good at. What are what are those four keys that you talk about to building strength, especially for women mm. over forty? Yeah, I love talking about this. So if at any point you need to rein me in, feel free to <laughs> feel free to do that. Okay. So the the four things I really help um, my clients and and the people in my community with, and I really talk about a lot are okay. Number one, fueling. We have to understand how to eat in a way that's supportive of our bodies. And because we have been just bombarded and pounded with messages throughout our lives, especially as women, it, it's even harder to sometimes be able to step back and understand, hey, we actually need to support our bodies and give our bodies enough nourishment and enough energy if we want to go out and do the things that we want to do. So really understanding also what is sort of a priority. And I talk a lot about this this concept called the priority pyramid, which is I I see a lot of women coming into my sphere and they think or they ask, you know, hey, you know, what's like the best supplement that I should take to, you know, do X, Y, Z? And I appreciate that question. <laughs> and I do believe supplements have a place. But also my my knee-jerk reaction to that is to say, okay, wait a sec, let's talk about all this other stuff first. Um because oftentimes we're chasing fixes for problems that could be addressed with other changes in so far as you know what is our what are our foundational food habits that's so 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 important you know are we skipping a lot of meals are we making coffee our only thing that we're eat, we're drinking for breakfast and then going to train which is actually not really great for for women uh, in perimenopause and, and older especially you know what is what are our what is our day like what are our challenges with fueling and and just having food on hand you know do we have a system for food either prep or or getting food and having it <laughs> available these are like the questions that we start with then we talk, take a look at things like energy balance we look at meal composition and understanding for example yes because we become a little bit more insulin resistant as we go towards that menopause transition you know, how do we shift the sort of balance of or the composition of what we're eating? How do we ad address pre and post workout and, and sort of fueling around our workout time, which is very important. And then, yes, like we finally get to the top of that, the pinnacle of that pyramid is is supplementation. So I think fueling for me is, you know, a lot of people want to get into the nitty gritty, but I also really make my <laughs> students go to the basics first. And a lot of the things that they're struggling with, with their energy levels, like they're not, they're not even able to slow the loss of muscle, but they're not even putting any muscle on. It's just really difficult for them sometimes to, to take a, a step back and look at the bigger picture. So that's what I do with that key. The second key is lifting. Of course, we have to understand that we need the stimulus. We need to lift heavy enough and that's very relative to each person, but we really need to provide our muscles the the signal that says, hey, <laughs> we're going to not only um, be able to do these workouts, but we want to grow or we want to give as much signal as we can for strength. And there are some considerations there for women as we're approaching, you know, 40s and beyond. The third one is looking at recovery. We have to be smarter about recovery. We have to look at, you know, are we giving a hard effort, but also following up with a more complete recovery because we are more tending toward a little bit higher cortisol, right? We don't want to just keep adding stress on stress on stress. We have to be really strategic and smart. And then the fourth area that I talk about is calm, which is related to recovery, but it's really looking at our parasympathetic nervous system versus our sympathetic nervous system. Also how we work with data because fit tech and data collection are so common. Um, you know, How do we look at those things and understand what they're what it's telling us countered by our body's own feedback. You know, how do we put those two things together? So those are the four areas that we address a lot, a lot, a lot with women because 
we've just been fed so much misinformation or bad information, or we're trying to do the same things that we were doing in our 20s and it's not working anymore. Yes. Amen. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, I'm going to ask you this question. Yeah. With the preface, uh, you know, usually we keep this show to about 30 minutes. So (laughs) what what are common nutrition mistakes women are making? Wow. This is a big one. Um, Okay. I generally put these into three categories because these are the three biggest buckets that I see with my clients. The first one is under eating. And that surprises a lot of people because, again, we we hear a lot of the old adage, eat less, move more, eat less, move more. But the population of women that I work with are very active. They may not be competing in athletics, but they are very active. They are, I say they're athletics, they're athletic women. They may not compete as an athlete in competition. There may not be an elite athlete but they are very active. They are doing their lifting. They are doing their Peloton. They are doing their yoga. They are going to Pilates. They are hiking. They are getting out there with their families. They're very active. And in 2016, there was a study done in New Zealand where they took a look at recreational exercisers. So these were women who didn't self-identify as athletes, I guess, in terms of the study. They didn't identify as competitive, competitive athletes, elite athletes. Half of those women, about it was about 45% of those women were at risk for low energy availability, which means that they did not have enough energy coming in by way of what they ate to support their basic bodily functions, especially when exercise was added on almost half. That's a lot. And and so I think we have to think about what are stuff. Can I interrupt you just right there for for (laughs) for a listener? Mm -hmm. What I want is for them to understand stuff. What happens in that situation? Absolutely. So we have energy needs for our body, and those basic energy needs for our body is our basal metabolic rate. Right. These are the systems in our body that are keeping us alive. If we were at complete rest. Think lying on the couch doing nothing. Your body needs a certain amount of energy just to keep your functions alive, right? These are your cellular processes. This is your cognitive ability. This is your respiration, your breathing, your heart rate, your thermoregulation, your ability to actually keep yourself, you know, in in the right energy, uh, right temperature range. So this is very, very important that we're providing enough energy for that. So what are some of the consequences if we don't provide enough energy? Things like, of course, we would expect decreased performance, a reduction in strength, excessive amounts of soreness, recurring injuries, disruptions to the menstrual cycle, irritability, mood changes, decreased motivation to move around. You know, you just kind of want to sit around and that's a, actually a big mental challenge for people because they think, what's wrong? What's wrong with me? What's going on? More fatigue, bone density, impact bone density, right? Mineral um, and sort of uh, nutrient deficiencies, low iron, right? So these are a lot of things that a lot of women struggle with. And just insofar as looking at our energy intake right off the bat, we want to make sure that we're staying at least, you know, we're providing enough energy for our body to run its basic bodily functions when we take our energy expenditure from exercise into account as well. So So here's the, here's the kicker. So often a listener might, who might be committing this error, either intentionally or unintentionally, if intentionally, she's probably doing it because she believes this will accelerate her weight loss. Mm-hmm. Will that happen? <laughs> oh, this is um this is the the big question, right? Because we're told again that we have to reduce reduce reduce, eat less, move more, and what we tend to see in those cases is we're going to start losing muscle mass. Our body is going to try to make energy from our tissues. And one of the tissues that it loves to make energy from is our muscle tissue. So we're going to break down 
muscle tissue use those amino acids to make energy. So we're already right off the bat stealing (laughs) precious muscle tissue from our bodies in order to create some of that energy, which in turn has an effect on our metabolism, right? You mentioned, you know, muscle being a, an endocrine tissue. It's a very metabolically active tissue. It's a metabolically expensive tissue. And we're going to start losing that. That's going to make it more difficult for you to see progress, you know, if you're, you're lifting and training right as it is. And not eating enough is also going to do things like elevate your cortisol, which is going to do things like promote fat storage, which again is sort of this thing that so many women I know get frustrated with. They're like, I don't know what's happening. All of a sudden, you know, my body composition is really changing and I don't get it. So and I should I should just do more and I should work out harder and cut down less, <laughs> cut down the food. Oh gosh, this is my right? favorite thing right here. The favorite yeah. insanity award goes to that yeah. person who is like, it's not working. Mm-hmm. I'm going to do more of what's not working. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So we have a, you know, metabolism starts to um, creep down a little bit. And when you don't eat enough food, yes, you have a metabolic down regulation. So your body is trying to slow you down to conserve, which means that everything is going to stick on you. You're lowering that meta- metabolism or that uh, like metabolically most active tissue because you're stealing muscle tissue from your body in order to make energy. And your cortisol is much higher now, so it's going to promote the opposite thing that you're trying to achieve, which is it's going to promote fat storage instead of fat loss. So obviously, well, this there has to be a bit of a balance. We can't just you know eat far, far, far above our caloric needs either, our energy needs. But mm-hmm. I think people would be surprised at you know how much they're cutting down. And, and like you said, sometimes it's unintentional, right? We get busy, or we we heard fasting, fasted training is like the best thing since sliced bread. Okay, we should do that. Okay, oh, we should eat incredibly low carb and we should do that. And then we should do HIIT training and then we should do lifting. And and then we've piled all this stuff on top. And this is where I see women really at the end of their their rope as it is feeling like I'm doing all the things I'm everybody says is the best thing. And I'm just exhausted. And I'm seeing the opposite of what I want, which is, you know, preserve, maintain, build some muscle mass, see some potential shift in body composition, you know, not have the accumulation of that sort of visceral um, fat. And it just is, it's really, really, it it takes a bit of a a shift in mindset to think, okay, well, I'm going to have to eat a little bit more. And so this kind of brings me to the second mistake is eating too low protein. And if you are working out, you are lifting in order to build your strength and it's going to be that much harder to build a lot of muscle mass as we enter into perimenopause and then beyond because of a a bunch of different factors related to estrogen, including things like our muscle satellite cells, which are sort of the the stem cells in our muscles that really help to uh, kick off muscle growth. They struggle a lot more in that time. So we really have to provide our bodies the substance, the substrate, the protein in order to get muscle protein synthesis going. And if you're lifting, and I posted about this the other day, it was like, if you're trying, if you're lifting and you're trying to maintain or or build some muscle mass and you're not eating enough protein, it's like poking holes in the bottom of a boat before you go out for a paddle. It's, It's kind of defeating the purpose. So that would be, I think, the second big mistake that I see with a lot of women is they're just not eating nearly enough protein. And I get it. It's tough. It's tough to have that on hand. You have to think about it. You have to be organized and prepared. And it's not the, it's, it's one of those things where information and and thinking, okay, yes, I know I should get more protein is different than the implementation, which is how am I going to spread this throughout my day? When do I need to, you know, think about having a a snack here or what am I going to put on my plate? that's where things start to get tricky. So um, too low protein is affecting your ability to recover and repair your muscle tissue, which is 
so, so precious because of what we just talked about with things like metabolism and your, your the ability for you to to not become sarcopenic and uh, not have dynapenia, which is the loss of strength, power, and the loss of muscle tissue as you're getting older. So good. Yeah, these are these are just so spot on. I think we're, <laughs> we're speaking the same language, but I love to make sure that we're driving it home. Mm-hmm. And you you alluded to something here, and you know talked about relativity when we talk about lifting mm-hmm. heavy and what that what that really is. But let's break that down. So, yeah. what does lifting heavy really mean? And this is. This is so good. So many women I find still have this question. It's mm-hmm. like, how much? What yeah. weight are you lifting? And I'm like, I can't tell you. I'm mm-hmm. not going to tell you. I have to kill you. Yeah. <laughs> I know. They're like, just tell me. And and and. But you know that it's it's different. It, it, it when you're when somebody starts lifting for the first time, the weights that are heavy to them at that point are going to be different than somebody like me who's been lifting for 12 years. Mm-hmm. And. Right. And I think also we tend to see, and I, I try as much as I can to put videos of when I first started lifting. I have a few really awfully pixelated old <laughs> videos of me, you know, 10, 12 years ago starting to lift and to remind people that this is a process. But I think a couple of things. First of all, yes, you have to start where you're at, but, and you also need to progress over time. And that's where a smart training plan with progressive overload. That means slowly over time, you're inching up the weight, the volume, which is the reps or sets, the, um, you know, potentially adding in things like tempo and variety with different variations of exercises, like that progressive overload is important. So when we talk about heavy, what does that mean? Heavy, and I'm using air quotes, right? Heavy (laughs) here is we're we're really looking at somewhere in the range of sets of 5 to 8 5 to 8 reps. Okay, so there's that. Because that's really going to help us stay in the in in a little bit more bias toward building strength. Yeah, hey, Steph, I'm just going to back up. Yeah. So, for listeners, I think you might have said sets where you meant reps. So you mean oh, rep- reps. Yeah, repetitions <laughs> in this, and, and you said both, but for listeners yes. who already confuse those two in their minds, I yes. just want to stop and let's just not roll over it. So Thanks. I do this all the time too. At yep. 38 years, I can do it <laughs> tomorrow, I promise you. So um, listeners, what we're talking about is, and we'll get to this, so we should also address how many sets of those mm-hmm number of reps. So between five and eight repetitions per set. And then also let's address how many sets. It's going to depend on the exercise. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see people doing at least three sets. So three sets of five to eight reps. Mm -hmm. It depends on their recovery. It depends on what else they're doing that day. But really we're looking at what's going to give us that strength bias toward the strength end of the spectrum because we really have low repetitions is when they're appropriately loaded and heavy are going to help us build strength. The moderate range is really where we're going to get muscle growth. So that's that hypertrophy muscle growth. The higher end of the rep range, so we're talking 15, 20 plus reps, this is going to be our muscular endurance especially as we're aging, we need to work those lower repetitions. So again, I would say somewhere between five and eight reps because we need to engage the most muscle fiber. There are different types of muscle fibers. We need to engage as much of our muscle fiber as possible because as we age, especially if we do not use those muscle fibers that are involved with strength or moving explosively, we start to lose them and they get converted into type one fibers, which are Mm -hmm. our slowly, slow moving fibers, which are great. We need that too. We need those like long lasting and we want to go for long walks and do those sorts of things. But when we lose those, those more explosive fibers, this is where we're at risk for things like dynapenia, which is loss of explosive power, loss of uh, the ability to, you know, even think about stumbling, you stumble, how are you going to catch yourself when you stumble? Like that ability to react quickly. 
is very, very important. So we want to work those lower repetition, five to eight reps. Um, I would say, you know, de- again, depending on the person, at least three sets, um, potentially a little bit more, but really looking to make it hard. It has to be hard for you. The last one or two reps should feel like a challenge. It it should feel like I've really got to concentrate. I've got to really work to finish that rep and maintain that like mind muscle connection. And if you're sort of doing your thing and you're like, you know, hey Deborah, how's it going today? You know, like what's going on with the family? And, and you're not really having to pay attention and focus, it's probably too light. Um, if you pick up the first rep and you can barely lift it, it's too heavy. So Perfect. That's generally the, and and like you said, it's going to be different. And I think this is where knowing, getting to know yourself through the practice of lifting is going to be really, really key. Um, also potentially working with someone, especially at the beginning who can say, you know, Hey, that, that's, that one, look, that set looked really easy. Let's like, you know, see if you go up five pounds and see what's going to happen here. Um, and I'll also add to that, you know, I'm looking at things like, are we doing compound movements? Like, are we including a base of compound movements? And these are things like squats, deadlifts, hinges, presses, those sorts of things. Carries, love me a carry, love me a a grocery bag challenge. (laughs) Um, And that can be intimidating for people. And I totally get it. They're like, oh my gosh, I've never squatted in my life. How am I going to do this? And the answer is you start slow and you work up. But those compound movements are really going to work a lot of muscle at one time. They're really, really efficient. And they're also oftentimes going to have a really great carryover and mimic things that we're doing in our daily life. Right? You want to sit down to a, a low surface or a low bench that's a squat. You want to pick up a heavy bag of dog food. <laughs> that's going to be a deadlift, for example. So really, yes, like we can do those sorts of um, isolation and and uh, accessory movements for sure. But oftentimes I see women defaulting to those because they seem more approachable and they're not as intimidating. That's really where a great coach can help you to gain that confidence, to work up slowly, to understand how to move in space and potentially give you some modifications as necessary so that you feel confident and you're able to get those benefits. That was gold right there. So listeners, you want to let that sink in. So <laughs> I love it. So when when I think accessories, I think like gold hoop earrings. Like I can go out of the house without those. I can't go out without my shirt, right? And <laughs> you need to think of, you know, some of the things that you reach for. I like to also make sure you know, or a woman listening knows that like what you want and the reason why you also might be driven to those accessory things is you want to go right for the sleeveless worthy arms that you're targeting. But the truth is you get those just as a side benefit when you do the core major muscle groups and those compound exercises. So there is beauty in that where if you're not truly changing the body composition by doing those bigger things, you may not actually see the definition and tone in those arms. So Mm -hmm. it's a two for one if you do it right. Yeah. And it's actually a lot harder to build because of that we talked about earlier, the satellite cells in your muscle tissue really struggle without that strong estrogen signal. It's actually a little bit harder to just build straight up muscle. And I'm using like air quotes here, but like bulk, Mm -hmm. right? In terms Mm -hmm. of like really building the amount of muscle tissue that you would have been able to build when you were 20. Mm -hmm. However, you can still build strength. So it may be harder to build potentially the, you know, you're you're not going to be able to get big and bulky. It's just it's just not going to happen. And yeah. it's really not going to happen, especially once you're getting into you know, your, your 40s and beyond. However, maintaining that strength, the ability to move quickly and sort of catch yourself as you're, as you're stumbling and falling. We were recently, we do take a walk every day and we live down the street from some senior housing. And there was, a, it's a busy street. There was a, uh, an older woman and she was trying to make it across the street before the light changed. And she mm-hmm. started to stumble. Oh. And it was like in slow motion and it broke my heart because she just couldn't 
catch herself. And of course she fell and we all sort of rushed out to make sure she was fine. She was okay. But, you know, I, I think sometimes we think about the immediate benefit of lifting or we focus on the, the, the body composition or, you know, it's going to feel really cool to lift something heavy and prove yourself that you can do it. But it's also really important to think about it like you're putting savings away for later. Because those things like those slips and falls, those stumbles, those, you know, injuries that are sometimes so common, especially when we have the low bone density and the osteopenia, the osteoporosis on top of it, it's just, it, it's a real thing. And it's something that I think no one really in their 40s, especially, or even younger wants to think about. But it's so, so critical for healthy aging and longevity and independence to be, you know, to have some base of strength. And like you said, those compound movements is they're so, so key. And I love your analogy about the <laughs> the earrings and the shirt. I always talk about cake and frosting. I'm like, no one loves a big, <laughs> no one loves a plate of frosting. Oh, wait, I do. <laughs> <laughs> Cream cheese, please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just the frosting, just the frosting. So we yeah. want a strong, we want something to put the frosting on, right? We want a base. And, and so that's those compound movements gives us. Yeah, and then if you tell anybody that, I'm going to have to kill you people. Okay. <laughs> it is safe with me and all these listeners. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Steph, this has been so good, so rich, so much content. I'm absolutely going to share your Instagram because that's, I know, where I came across you and I was like, oh, she's just speaking my language. Where else, where's the best place for listeners to get more stuff? Yeah, thanks for asking. Currently, I would say the podcast, which is in the process of being renamed. So it's going to be, you're, you're hearing it here first, actually. <laughs> it's going to be the Fuel Your Strength podcast. It's the same feed. So right now, if you go to listen, um, it's the Listen to Your Body podcast. We're going to be just switching the name to more clearly reflect what I'm doing right now. So there's that. And then my website, stephgodrow.com, has all sorts of other things on it um, you know, that you can check out and, and learn and, and so forth. So yeah. That'd be the best place. Fantastic. Thanks again for being here. Thanks. Okay. We've got three rapid fire questions. Number one, fasted or fed workouts, or it depends? Fed. Favorite lower body strength exercise? Sumo deadlifts. Ooh. Animal or plant protein, or it depends? Animal. Nice. <laughs> Did I pass? <laughs> They're just I'm like, wow. Most of them are like, let me think about it. Okay, good. <laughs> well, it's tough because I would say decisively, those are my answers. Also, there is a little bit of nuance in each one. So, yeah, totally. Okay. All right. Now, but you just gave me a great social media post, really. So that was what I wanted. <laughs> All right. Um, and we're not even going to do the, the audio. I'm just going to share that I asked you those questions. You have to tune in to get them. So mm -hmm. there you have it. And listeners, okay, now it's your turn. If there's a question that you wish I would have asked Steph, there's a lot of gold nuggets in here. You know, I don't say this every time, but I honestly think this would be a great one to rewind, take another lap around the block and <laughs> listen again, because she really dropped some great things, things that all of us, I think at one point or another need to hear again, because Let's face it, we've all had decades of conditioning of certain messages going in. I mean, I can say that in a meta way. I mean, my conditioning went so far as I taught some of these incorrect kinds of nuances in a classroom, you know, spreading them to more people for 15 years. And so it's going to take a minute not to default to what you think you need to do to get the progress that you want to have. So listening again is not a bad idea. And you're going to find the show notes for this one at flipping50.com forward slash eat for strength training. And what are you waiting for? Let's start flipping 50 today. 